a rock star campaigning for the cleaning up of TV. Um, uh, it says a lot about the early iterations of so-called rock and roll um, in, in Britain. This new musical culture was, of course, energised by the new types of publications. Um, Melody Maker, the big music uh, magazine, had been around since 1926, but the really important new kid on the block, so to speak, was the new Musical Express uh, that came out in 1952, and Sounds magazine that was launched in 1970. Uh, New Musical Express had a circulation over 200,000 by the end of the um, uh, 1950s and, and had reached half a million um, in the early 1970s. So there was newspapers, magazines for kids to read about music. There were also new television shows because both the BBC and the ITV wanted to capture this so-called youth um, uh, market. Um, and uh, the BBC launches um, uh, Six Five Special in 1957 and Pick of the Pops in 1962, which was still going strong when I was a kid. Um, and ITV had its rival, Oh Boy, all of which basically were playing the latest um, uh, hits and had, uh, following the movements of songs in the, um, in the charts. So if that was the domesticated, commercialised version of rock and roll, of the early forms of rock and roll, of course it came to prominence in the so-called style wars of the battles against mods and rockers, but of course The Who um, is so fantastically um, uh, uh, summoned up in the film Quadrophenia, which if you haven't seen, I, I urge you to see, or even the film Tommy, in which um, The Who um, did the soundtrack to. Um, these were effectively um, almost gang wars between two different groups of, groups of youth, mods and rockers, and they used in the middle of the 1960s to meet in rival groups, the rockers on their big motorbikes and the mods on their little Vespers, um, in the big seaside holiday resorts, most famously um, in Brighton, where there was the infamous Battle of Brighton in 1964. A huge violence between these two groups, fueled by, a, um, uh, by a, an increasingly uh, widespread drug culture. The drug culture in Britain, the relationship between young people and drugs, doesn't come in the so-called psychedelic 60s. It actually comes out of the 1950s and early 1960s, and in many ways is a product, some people have suggested, of the actual presence of the National Health Service. The National Health Service had meant that you had pharmacies across the country that had copious supplies of Valium and, 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 and amphetamines um, that were routinely broken into by uh, young people and uh, used um, on the black market. It was in response to this that a new drugs act was passed in 1964 to ban possession of speed without prescription because there was a recognition that so much of the drugs were um, prescription drugs available through the National Health Service. Um, the last thing I want to say about drugs, basically, is that in Britain, there really isn't the big LSD moment that there was here. Instead, we had the very sort of common, uh, common gardenal drugs like grass and hash and magic, uh, magic mushrooms were probably the, you know, the, the most psychedelic uh, um, of, of them all. And it was reputed that there were sort of two million users of these drugs by 1970, and I would say that they were all under 30. So that's the sort of conventional music scene, so to speak. I want to talk now about the formation of an alternative music scene. Um, and that really I take, takes a number of different forms, um, because the commercialised forms of youth music seem to be very anodyne um, to many people. The BBC has a continuing monopoly over broadcasting, doesn't set up Radio 1 until 1967. Radio 1 was the station that broadcasted um, uh, uh, you know, young people's uh, music. Instead, people listen to so-called pirate radios, like Radio Luxembourg um, and Radio Caroline and, um, and Radio um, London. And these were broadcast from ships in the English Channel just outside of the jurisdiction of, uh, the, um, uh, of the British government. There's a um, quite funny film called The Boat That Rocked that came out a few years about um, life on these um, pirate radio stations. Many of the disc jockeys that play, came to fame in these pirate radio stations went on to become the leading uh, DJs on Radio um, 1 in the 1970s and even the 1980s. The other thing, of course, was the development of free music festivals. Um, and in the week of Coachella, it's like a good time to talk about this stuff where once you could go to festivals free. Um, so Woodstock, of course, had happened in 1969, um, and the British equivalent was Glastonbury, still going strong um, to uh, this, this, this day. Um, but there were a host of other free music festivals, as you can see from this flyer that was handed around at, 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 um, at Glastonbury, where you have basically throughout the summer a whole series of sort of impromptu free festivals that people could attend and chill out to. Um, there's a film of um, uh, Glastonbury that was uh, uh, directed by Nicholas Rowe and produced by David Putnam um, uh, uh, that came out in 1971, um, which you can watch um, on YouTube. Um, I, I watch it. It's very Sometimes like, when... I haven't got the summit for it, I'm afraid, but, um, uh, but um, uh, I watch it because it's quite, um, uh, it's, it's very evocative if you like that type of thing. I want instead, though, to talk about my childhood hero, um, who was um, a disc jockey on um, uh, Radio 1, known as um, John Peel. And it was John Peel who, during the 1970s and 1980s, basically played, was a main conduit for um, uh, 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 independent music um, in Britain. He, he broadcast between 10 and 12 p.m. Um, uh, five days of uh, the week. And the whole point of the show was to provide you with an alternative musical agenda than that that had uh, been played during the day, which was the big popular, you know, commercialised um, uh, pop songs. John Peel basically launched almost every favor, uh, uh, famous sort of indie act in Britain through the 70s and uh, the 1980s. And he did it in relationship with the development of the proliferation of new independent labels. So for a long time in Britain, as in the US, EMI and Decca had basically a monopoly over the uh, recording and publishing industry. And it wasn't really, although Island Records was formed in 1959, it wasn't really until the late 1970s that you have new independent labels like Rough Trade and uh, Factory um, being formed. Now the point that I want to make here is that John Peel, who comes out of pirate radio, tries, just like many of the other forms of counterculture that I've been talking about today, in a way reinscribes elitism. What he's doing is to say, look, commercial popular music is just dreadful, and that I have a higher aesthetic standard. I can guide you to more virtuous, more valuable forms of musical production. So the, a, he trades on the very exclusivity of and the very uncommercial nature of the music that he plays. And I think that's very, um, a, a very important element to, his, um, uh, to, uh, to that work. OK. Um, let me wrap up. So a number of um, 
a point just to, to reiterate. Um, the first thing is to return to this, the silliness of history by decay. Clearly, what I've been talking to you about today is, is the revolt of a particular generation. Okay? And that revolt, I suggested, starts earlier than 1960, and it lasts longer than at the end of 1969. Um, it's also, I would say, a very uneven process. I, most of the events that we've, I've been talking about today were predominantly took place in and around London. London was really the key site for many of these new forms of politics and culture that emerged around young people in the 1960s. There are pockets that happen elsewhere, but primarily this is a metropolitan story. Where I grew up, for instance, and where my parents lived throughout the 1960s, very little of this culture was apparent, even though I was less than 100 miles from London. But the revolt of this generation was a revolt, I'm suggesting, against the paternalism that had been went through British society from the 18th century to the present, but had manifested itself most recently in the forms of social democracy and welfare capitalism of the um, post-war period. And we need to take those criticisms very seriously. That social democracy, as I have been at pains to emphasize in the last few weeks, despite its universal claims, did fundamentally leave out or neglect certain key sets of issues and, and demographics. And in many ways, you can see these youth revolts as a response to that. But I'm also trying to say to you that we shouldn't reify that, these new forms of counterculture. We shouldn't think, as the Berkeley campus is sometimes prone to do, that these people were giants that we can never replace. Because in Britain at least, and I would suspect this is also applies to the US, in many ways these forms of counterculture, I've tried to suggest, were a product of commercialization. Of commercialization that had run through youth culture from the 1950s. And were also tended to inscribe a new form of elitism. A new form of elitism that took their culture to be superior to other forms of popular culture. This was the point of counterculture, that it sat itself out, outside of what it considered to be the mainstream. Um, and so in many ways what I'm trying to indicate here is that this elitism is not that dissimilar to the types of elite paternalism that the 60s is in revolt from. The last point I want to make um, in this longest of all long lectures um, was that the other key consequence of the 1960s was, I would suggest, the rise of a new type of identity politics around um, a, a, a sex, gender and race. And a key part of that type of identity politics, at least in its formation in the 60s and 1970s, was about personal emancipation. It was a rejection that the state, and particularly the social democratic state, could deliver emancipation. That alternative forms of mobilisation and social organisation were necessary to emancipate women, uh, gays and lesbians, and, um, uh, and uh, Catholics in Northern Ireland or, 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 or black nationalists on the, um, on the mainland. So the key issue, I think, that this set of politics struggles with was how far those struggles were going to be about a broader social transformation than it was about an individual one. And I think if you want a single example of that tension, think about the women's liberation movement. Determined to raise consciousness for individual women, and yet trying to raise their consciousness in ways that try to theorise what it was that women had in common. What were the common things that oppressed women that they needed to escape from? And that tension between individual emancipation and collective emancipation is, I think, the main legacy of this moment of the 1960s. Thank you very much.